What's up guys, Tenender Lifestyle, we're gonna do a video that I've been requested hundreds of times, literally hundreds of times to do, and that is a ring and pinion install. Believe it or not, the proper installation process for ring and pinion installs is somewhat controversial. There are multiple ways to get to the same destination with multiple different tool types, and this is just one of those topics that I know the backlash in the comments is gonna be ridiculous. But I wanna make it really clear that this is just giving you guys what you've asked for. You wanna see a video on how I accomplished this task, and that is exactly what this video is gonna entail. Throughout this video, we're gonna be bouncing back and forth between using professional tools and talking about ways that you can accomplish these little tasks without the professional tools. I wanna make it to where you can weigh the pros and cons and decide whether or not you want to go out and buy the tools to do this job yourself or whether or not that's it's just too complicated or too expensive and you'd rather just pay a pro the axle we're working on today is a dana 60 high pinion from a 2004 ford f350 this is originally a driver's side drop axle that i converted to a passenger and if that's a process you want to see i will put a link to that video in the description of this video all of the tools you will see today will be in an amazon shopping cart and i'll put that in the description as well the first thing we need to do is install our pinion. And before we can just go dropping the brand new pinion into this housing, we need to take the old pinion and pull some measurements off of it. There is a pinion shim that goes in behind this bearing right here. And what that does is it's gonna set the pinion depth. The pinion depth is basically what this entire job is all about. It's all about having the right amount of depth so that we have the right amount of tooth to tooth contact in the right spot <laughs> in order to satisfy the manufacturer's specifications. If you want this to go in deeper, you need to put more shim in it. If you need it to go uh, out and be more shallow, you put less shim in it. So there is a factory shim that is in this pinion that we're gonna harvest and we're gonna install onto the new pinion. We're gonna use a bearing puller. The best way to do this is to probably buy a pinion depth measuring tool, and that just goes into the, uh, it just goes right here in the housing, and then it, it, it gives you a perfect measurement between the center line um, to the face of your pinion. And that's really nice because with some basic math, if you have that measurement, you can figure out exactly what shim to put in there and you're usually money, but we don't have access to that. What most people do is exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the factory shim out, we're gonna put it onto our new pinion, and then we're gonna use that to get us in the ballpark, and then by reading our pattern, we'll be able to tell if it needs more shim, less shim, whatever. The second thing we need to figure out um, off of this OEM pinion is going to be how big to make our crush sleeve eliminator. So there's a crush sleeve that goes right here, and what this crush sleeve does is it sets our pinion preload. These two bearings are opposing, meaning that they each face, they each go into a race and the two races are going different directions. So the tighter we make the bearings into these races, the more preload we're gonna have. There's a factory specification that we need to shoot for. And instead of using a crush sleeve, which is kind of a pain, we're gonna use a crush sleeve eliminator. And all we're gonna do is we're using a set of shims that are going to bring these bearings closer together or farther apart based on what we need. One tool that you can do this job without, but I highly recommend you get it anyway, is a bearing puller kit. This is an absolute lifesaver in so many situations, but if you're creative enough and you're willing to go out and buy a bunch of setup bearings, then you can do this job with a series of setup bearings instead of the bearing puller. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna remove the old bearing off of the old pinion, and then I'm gonna take the shim off of the old pinion and drop it onto the new one. Then I'm gonna take a die grinder with a carbide bit, and I'm gonna slowly auger out the inside diameter of this bearing to give me proper clearance so that I can slide this bearing on and off without the puller periodically throughout this process. We're gonna be pulling this stuff apart and putting it back together a bunch, and it is much faster if you can make yourself a set of setup bearings or just go to Yukon and buy them. I just got finished making and cleaning up our two setup bearings and they're tight, but you can still get them off by hand, which is exactly what we're looking for. So the next thing we need to do is we need to set up our pinion preload. And like I said over there on the whiteboard, the pinion preload is the relationship between these two bearings. So the closer they are together, the tighter the preload's gonna be, the farther they are apart, the looser it's gonna be. With some aftermarket manufacturers, they actually machine the shoulder higher up. If you look at these two pinions, you're gonna notice that this is lower than that. 
And that's because they make it to where you don't have to use a crush sleeve or a crush sleeve eliminator. And you can actually just stack shims right, well, wrong way. You can actually just stack shims right underneath this bearing. So this is what the crush sleeve eliminator looks like. Super simple, just like that. If you need to add shims, you just plop them on the inside there, sack it, put it underneath here. And then uh, what we would normally do is we would measure the size of this crush sleeve and then we would replicate that same size with this crush sleeve eliminator as a way to get us in the ballpark. But what we're gonna have to do now is we're gonna have to measure, I'm not gonna be able to get that off with one hand. We're gonna have to measure from this surface to the top of our crush sleeve and then we're gonna do the same thing here. We're gonna measure from this surface. Well actually, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna measure from the bearing surface to the top of our crush sleeve and then from the bearing surface to the top of our shim stack. Then we can plop this in there. That should get us in the ballpark. We can install it and measure our preload. Taking this measurement is pretty easy. All we need to do is take the backside of the micrometer. We're gonna measure from the top of the bearing to the top surface of this crush washer. And then we can uh, do the exact same thing, but with the shims on the opposite pinion. This is just gonna get us in the ballpark. That's all we're trying to do with all these measurements at the beginning here. We're just trying to get them really close and then we can make adjustments from there. But we're saving ourselves a lot of steps by starting with some basic measurements instead of just going in blind. I clean these setup bearings really well and then I add oil to make sure that everything is well lubricated and it slides easy enough that we can get an accurate measurement whenever trying to measure our bearing preload. Once I have this pinion dressed up and ready to go in, I'm gonna drive our races into the housing using a brass drift punch. Now you can actually use steel to do this, but know that you can score up the sides of your race if you're not really careful. I have done it for a number of years without using a brass drift, but I finally decided to pony up and buy one because it's just an important tool to have for jobs like this so you don't score up any of your bearing surfaces. I'm gonna make everything nice and tight by driving this factory yoke down into the housing using my impact. I'm then gonna measure our preload by using a bar type torque wrench that measures in inch pounds. And I picked this one up for my father-in-law, but you can still buy these on Amazon for 20 or 30 bucks. Now this is one of those examples of when you can use an inexpensive tool to accomplish the same job as an expensive tool because you can get a really nice dial style, I guess, torque wrench off of Amazon as well. It's about 150. I'm sure it's more accurate. I'm sure it's much easier to use, but it's just too much money for a tool that I'm gonna use so seldom. The preload we're looking for here is between 17 and 30 inch pounds. We were at just under 20. I wanna have a little bit more than that. So I'm gonna remove a couple thousands, put it back together and see where we're at. With the pinion installed into the housing, we can move on to the ring gear. The ring gear is going to get mounted to the deck surface of this air locker. This is a air locker from Yukon. It's called the zip locker. And we wanna make sure that the marriage between this flat surface and that flat surface is completely true. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dress down this gear. We're going to clean it up with a little bit of alcohol or acetone. And then we're gonna take this file and we're gonna slowly run this file really lightly all the way around and we're gonna slowly remove some of this black coating that's on here and it's gonna be able to help us see if there's any dings or if there's any high spots or anything that would give us some problems. Sometimes things get missed whenever it's machined and before we go through all this work, we wanna, concern, we wanna confirm that the back of this has no dings or nicks and that it's definitely flat. If there's a really big discrepancy, we should be able to see it by just polishing up this surface with a flat edge like you get with a file. After stripping all the oil off of this gear, I'm gonna run this file as absolute flat as possible, very lightly across the back of the gear, just trying to remove a little bit of these black spots and look for anything that's out of the ordinary, any high spots, any dings from just, just this getting thrown into a pile with other ring gears, or even just a burr from the machining process. A lot of times, if you have a ding or a burr, you can just use this file to flatten that out to make sure that we don't have any wobble in this gear that could potentially cause a problem later on down the road. There's a few different ways that you can seat your ring gear onto the carrier, and to me, the easiest way is to just use the bolts. I thread all the bolts into the bolt holes of the ring gear using one of my lighter impacts, and the first time that I seat all these bolts, I don't use any Loctite or anything, I just do it dry. Now I'm gonna make my own setup bearing and my own setup washer that I'm gonna rob off of the old carrier that I pulled out of this Dana 60. These are extra steps that you don't necessarily have to take, but for me, I think that it's worth the extra time. 
Now that I have the seal housing side bearing installed onto this locker, I'm now gonna remove all the bolts and clean out the holes that are holding the ring gear to the carrier. I'm gonna use compressed air to blow out all the holes and make sure there's no debris in there so we get a really good smooth torque rating. Each bolt's gonna get a little bit of red Loctite before I send them back into the carrier. And then we're gonna wedge the carrier into the press so it doesn't move around on us while we're giving it this final torque. I'm taking a few extra steps with this that uh, if you read the comments, I'm sure you're gonna see people mention you don't have to do, and they're definitely right. And one is that I am making some spacers to press these bearings on. I like pressing bearings on with an augered out old bearing because it just, it fits perfect. It puts no pressure on the cage and it makes it to where it's just nice to have. Now with the air lockers, I don't know what this little guy is. It's, it's like just a little ball. <laughs> And a long time ago, I did an air locker where I was pressing the bearing in on this side, and this was just on a flat piece of steel, and it distorted that hole a little bit. I don't know what this is for, I don't wanna mess it up, and so it's nice to have this guy right here to make sure that whenever I do press the bearing onto the other side, it's not gonna distort that hole at all. So this is a free bearing, it came off of the old carrier, and now that I have it augered out, it's perfect for any time I do Dana 60s. It's just gonna sit in a box and be ready for whenever I need to get to that point. Also, something else that you don't have to do but I would like to do with this is I wanted to set this up to where I could put the shims underneath the bearing. I have had um, air lockers enough to know that that thing is really on there, <laughs> to know that you're gonna have to occasionally service these seals right here. Now, sometimes they'll last five years, sometimes they'll last one year. I, I don't know why some last longer than others. I, I have figure it's probably because of the amount of shavings that it sees. But in any case, I wanna be able to pull this out, not have to deal with shims or anything. I can just pull the seal housing off, plop a new one on, and put this back in the housing. That's important to me. So because of that, I wanna have the shims underneath this bearing over here, and to figure out exactly what shim pack to use, means I would be pulling the bearing on and off a lot. So because I made a setup bearing, it's gonna make this first part way faster where I'm trying to figure out exactly how many shims I need. And then whenever we go through and figure out um, how many shims we need, we can press the bearing on and it'll be a done deal. So that's why I took the extra time and I made a setup bearing. Once again, this is not the last Dana 60 I'm gonna do. So I have a setup bearing done and made and it's just gonna sit in a box. It'll make the next job that much faster. I could immediately tell that the lash between the ring and pinion is way too tight. So I'm pulling the carrier back out. I'm gonna remove some shims and I'm gonna drop it back in there and see how much closer we are. When I can, I like to use feeler gauges to cheat and see how much of a gap I have so I'm not just guessing on the table. I'll use a pry bar to pry the carrier over or even just pry a race over a little bit so I can squeeze the feeler gauge in its place and see how much shim I need to add. Okay, so right now I'm still just adjusting the shims from side to side, and uh, we don't have quite enough preload on these bearings yet, but initially this was too tight, so the, the teeth from the ring gear were too tight with the teeth on the pinion gear, and so I'd had like, it wasn't making any noise whenever I was doing this, and it, it might be hard for you guys to hear in the camera, but there's like a little bit of movement, which is what we're gonna be measuring for backlash. So right now we don't have the bearing caps or anything on because I'm just figuring out what shims to put in there. So we haven't quite got to the bearing cap part yet. Um, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take a feeler gauge, wherever they are, here we go. I'm gonna stick it back behind here. I'm gonna figure out exactly what space we have back here so I know what shim to put in between the seal housing and this bearing race. Um, and what I think I'm gonna do because of how tight everything still is, is I'm gonna pull two thousandths out of this shim and if I measure like 10 thousandths on this right now, I'll just add two to this side. So that means that instead, so if I measure 10 thousandths that I need to put for a shim on this side, I'm gonna put 12 thousandths in and I'm gonna remove like two thousandths. So it should bring the whole thing over a little bit more and it's gonna set some actual preload in here so the housing isn't loose side to side. I mean, it's 
it's pretty tight side to side, but I can get some movement just by pushing it this way. Oh yeah, so you can hear what's going on. So then once I get those shims back in, once I get the shims in there and we get this back in the housing, I can put the bearing caps on, we can zip those down and then we can actually measure our backlash and see exactly where we're at. Okay, right now our backlash is 12 to 13, somewhere in that ballpark. Yukon says that they wanna see it between six to 10. So that's okay. What we're trying to do right now is we're trying to get this really close to where we would want it, which it is. And then we can paint the gears and we can read our pattern to see if our pinion is at the right depth. Remember, that's still what we're trying to do. We're just trying to set everything up to where we can determine whether or not we need to add or remove shims from our pinion. How lucky did we get here? Holy crap, that is close to a perfect pattern. So I'm gonna go over on the whiteboard. I'm gonna draw something up real quick and I wanna show you guys exactly how to read this pattern and what exactly we are looking for. There's a bunch of industry specific lingo that I would recommend you at least pull up on the internet if you do have a tech support question or you wanna to talk to anyone in the industry. This isn't something you necessarily need to memorize, but the reason that they do this is because if you say the inside of the gear, that could mean the inside of the gear itself or some people might think that the low part of the gear, which is the root, would be called the inside. So the reason that a lot of industries will make industry specific lingo is to make it so if you're talking to someone on the phone or through an email, you both are speaking the same language and it just makes it much easier um, for business. Now what we're concerned with today is where our contact patch is located on the gear. So ideally, you don't want this contact patch to run off any of these edges. That's what we're going for. So if it ends up being too far, um, up here on the uh, top end, then that's gonna make it to where we're gonna need to add a little bit of pinion depth to try and drive that this contact patch into the inside of the gear a little bit more. Same thing goes if it went down into the root of the gear. If it goes down to the root of the gear, we need to pull that pinion out a little bit in order to make this, whenever it becomes more shallow, it's gonna pull it back up into this inside. So we don't want this circle to bleed off too far on these edges. If it just touches the edge, that is kind of acceptable according to the Yukon book. Um, a lot of these, it's pretty amazing what kinds of patterns are acceptable, but the main thing you will notice whenever you look at the Yukon book, which by the way, this is a great installation guide that you can get in PDF form on their website, um, or if you just buy Yukon gears, it just comes with it. But what is acceptable is interesting, but one thing that you will find that is common with all these acceptable patterns is that they don't run off onto the top end and they don't run off down into the root. However, they do have acceptable patterns that will run off into the heel or that will run off into the toe and they say that's completely acceptable. I would say that our pattern is 100% acceptable. I should be, I'm very confident that if we just left it as is, it would be just fine. But what I wanna do is I'm going to set our backlash to factory or to our recommended spec from Yukon, which is six to 10. We'll just paint it and see if that changes it at all. I think it might change it a touch, but I'm not sure that it's gonna change it enough to pull this away from that edge, because if anything, we're just a little bit close to that edge, and I'm a perfectionist, so I'd like to bring it a little bit closer into the middle. So what I'm thinking is we're gonna start there, and then whenever we pull everything apart, we start pressing the bearings on for real, um, I am going to add the smallest shim I got. I mean, I'm probably gonna put a thousandth or a two thousandth into that pinion gear. And then when I reassemble everything back up, we will check it with paint just to see what it did. But what it should do is it should draw it just a little bit away from that edge and make me a little bit more comfortable. I wanna be super clear here for those of you that are new on reading patterns and how to adjust them. I don't, when I'm saying that I'm gonna recheck this pattern after I do my backlash, I wanna make it really clear that it's not how you would normally change your pattern. You change your pattern based on the depth of your pinion. 
But because we know our backlash is too loose, which means that the plane of this gear is farther away from the plane of that gear, our, our ring gear, or sorry, our pinion gear, that is going to make this pattern a little bit closer to the edge than it will be whenever we get it in spec. We're at like 12 to 13 thousandths. We wanna get it between six and 10. So probably just to help out our pattern, if we get it closer to six, I'd be super pumped about that. And the way we're gonna achieve this is by stacking shims on this side to tighten up our backlash. In turn, because we're tightening our backlash to get it closer to what the, um, the recommended spec is, that could help our pattern in drawing this patch away from this edge. So I just wanna make sure that that is super clear that you don't use backlash in order to adjust this pattern, but because we haven't nailed down our backlash 100% yet, that could help us in this instance. By adding a few shims over here on the passenger side of this axle, we were able to accomplish a few things that we needed. We were able to get our backlash down to seven, which is beautiful. We were able to drive this a little, drive this contact patch a little bit more away from the edge and makes it look, I mean, that is a perfect contact patch on the drive side of this gear. And we were able to add some extra preload. I, would, I had to tap it in with a hammer before, but it wasn't as much preload as I like. You wanna struggle a little bit. <laughs> you can add too much preload, but it's very difficult to add too much preload unless you're using a, ca a case stretcher. And with this seal housing on this side, anyone who's installed air lockers knows, you want lots of preload on that seal housing to make sure that you don't have it wandering around on you and uh, you're gonna wear out seals and get air leaks and whatnot. So we accomplished three really big things by adding those shims onto this side. Um, I really like the way this looks on the drive side. On the coast side, it's still a little bit high for me. I don't like that this is so close to the edge. So what I'm gonna do is uh, now we need to pull this whole thing apart. We're gonna press our bearings on for real. And while I'm doing that, I am going to add a tiny bit of shim on the pinion. Um, and then we'll, I'm very confident by adding just a couple just a couple thousandths on that pinion. It should bring this closer to what we want. So I'm gonna set this up for real. We're gonna put the bearings on and then we will have to readjust our backlash a little bit since we're adding some pinion depth. But I think that what it's gonna end up doing is it's gonna pull that contact patch on the coast side away from the edge and get us the pattern that we're looking for. definitely acceptable. I like it. So because we put three thousandths or two thousand, either between two and three thousandths on our pinion, it uh, actually pushed this contact patch in just a little bit, which is not the worst thing in the world for sure. Because whenever you accelerate, this is actually going to be working its way out a little bit um, under hard acceleration. So having it farther into the inside of the teeth is not the worst thing ever. And then on the coast side, we look a little bit better for sure. It's, uh, it's moved its way out a little bit, but it's also pushed its way 
into the root a little bit farther. Um, it is definitely close enough that we should have no problems. I'm not worried about this setup at all. And then we ended up being still at uh, seven thousandths for our backlash. Everything's torqued, everything's ready to go. So we only have a few things left to do. I'm gonna route this airline um, for our air locker connection, and then I'm going to put our rear seal on here and put on our new yoke. Apparently I didn't have the right yoke for this. It would not fit. The yoke that I have is for the Sterling, not for the 60, so I'm still waiting on the one for the 60 to show up. So I've got a set of chromoly shafts in here, and we are gonna bench test this locker. As you can see, I routed our copper line away from anything that could grab onto it, and this, this should be a pretty decent location. And then uh, whenever we turn on our power tank, it's gonna actuate this locker. So we'll see if I can spin it with one hand, but if I spin this one direction, oh man, that is hard to turn. Well, it's supposed to spin the other one the opposite direction. I bet if I set this uh, tripod down, we can do this. You can see them spin in different directions. Now, whenever we turn on the power tank, we should be able to hear it fire up in the axle. Oh yeah, you could hear it click over. So now whenever we spin the axle, it should go the exact same direction as the other axle. Ooh, that is hard to turn. Perfect, everything is functional. All right, I lied. I wanted to do one more thing before I wrap this video up. I wanted to put the cover on and just check out this axle, finally all in one piece, everything welded, everything installed. It's very cool to see it get to this point. If you guys watched the earlier part of this series, you saw that this was a driver's side drop axle that we chopped up and put all these brackets on and it's very cool to finally see it ready to bolt into this disco. For all of you that have been asking me to do this video, I hope that it meets your expectations. That we got so lucky for filming a topic as difficult as this. I mean, we could have had to pull that carrier and that pinion out of there 10, 15, 20 times to get everything dialed in. But that factory shim got us so close right out of the gate that this wasn't really that bad of an install. Now, that being said, this is a difficult topic to cover in its entirety, and I hope that I didn't gloss over too much stuff. I, I know when I'm editing tonight, I'm gonna be going crazy thinking, why didn't I cover this more thoroughly? Or I didn't even talk about that. So look at this video as like a basic education and an understanding of how to do this stuff. Don't look at this as like a supplemental instructional video that is giving you a step-by-step. -step. This, this should be a video that gives you a good glossed over idea of how all this works. And you should go out and do a lot of really good research, talk to pros, um, do a lot of research online and find out the exact way to do each one of these tasks. So I hope that at the end of the day, if you were watching this video because you wanna learn how to do it, this helps. If you were watching this to figure out if you wanna pay a pro to do it or if you wanna buy the tools to do it yourself, I hope this helps you as well. If you enjoyed the video, make sure you give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Mostly how-to content, some adventure stuff. Um, I like to build everything mild to wild. So if you're into that kind of thing, make sure you stick around. If you want to help support the channel, you go to thedirtlifestyle.com. We have t-shirts, hats, stickers, all kinds of stuff like that. We also have a link to our Patreon account if you want to help support us in that way as well. We also recently started a Facebook group called Dirtbag Mafia. So if you are into Facebook groups, this one is awesome. Everyone on there has been so outstanding. It's no politics, none of that stuff that you see on the rest of Facebook. It is just four by four stuff. There's tons of good technical Q&A. There's people getting together and wheeling. There's a lot of good reasons to join this group. So if that's something that interests you, just type in Dirtbag Mafia on Facebook and you should be able to find it. Also, I'll put a link to the Facebook group in the description. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time.